of uh, people going to the audit firm and people leaving the audit firm. So there's actually two different things that could happen. Someone could go from the, from the client, say IBM, and could go over to the audit firm. So they leave IBM and they go to whoever the auditors are. It can also happen the other way around. Someone who's an auditor goes and works for IBM. And that's very common to have it go from the CPA firm to the client. So, you know, there's, there's, there's actually a, a, a much, uh, much more, it has a much wider occurrence than uh, going the other way. Very rarely do, does someone go from IBM to a uh, CPA firm. It can happen, yeah, and I'm sure it has, but it's, it's, it's much less common. Okay, so the first thing we're going to tackle, uh, you know, I think I'm going to, let me go to the overhead camera, actually. Okay, um, so the first scenario is they go from, it is the, the, we're going to do the easy one first. They go from the client, say IBM, just an example, and they leave the client and they go work for the CPA firm. Okay, so here they are. They're happy and they're going to work for the CPA firm. So this is when they take a job with the CPA firm. So they come from IBM. Now, the CPA firm is still doing the audit. You know, there's, there's, they're still doing the audit here. So, you know, what rules do we have to worry about? Okay, a client gets hired by a CPA firm, a common. Okay, what are the rules? Uh, the new hire in the CPA firm cannot audit any work. Ah. For the client that they have performed. Let's say created. Okay, so they can't audit their own work, and that's one that's a kind of a common thing um, that you'll see through throughout kind of our discussion here. You cannot audit your own work. Now, you know, if you think about it from the standpoint of, you know, someone doing an audit, they go, oh, well, you know, I think, I think the person we have up here is called Gracie. Oh, well, Gracie worked at IBM. She'll know all about it. It makes common sense to put her on the audit. There could be a problem, though, and that is that if, if Gracie is auditing her own work, that's a problem. Now, yeah, Gracie might know a lot more about IBM than anyone else in the CPA firm, but she can't work on the audit if uh, she be auditing her own work. So let's take a look at the case. Gracie worked for IBM accounting department and was laid off from her position. Gracie took a job with the IBM auditors. Can Gracie participate in the IBM audit? What do you think? No. No, probably not. Now, if time goes on and, you know, a year or two goes by and the stuff that she worked on is no longer in the audit, then she can. But immediately after, and because she worked in the accounting department, now, if she had worked in marketing or something like that, 
probably could have done the audit. But because she's in the accounting department, it probably is a no-go. She'd probably be auditing her own work. Okay. Now, here is the more tricky one. And that is, nope, not me. That's this. <laughs> really didn't knock a garbage can down. It just uh, kind of like tipped over onto my chair. Okay, so this is where, oops, uh, it's going the other way. And this is a very common thing to have happen as the CPA firm. And we talked about this, I think a little bit before a CPA firm, it's up or out. And if they move you out of a CPA firm, they like to um, get you a job with a client. Uh, if for no other reason than when it comes to, I don't know why I'm making little people here, but uh, that when it, it comes to them deciding who they want for their auditors, they want kind of uh, someone saying, well, we want it to be whoever the CPA firm is here. So this is very common. This one is, um, it, it, it's a common thing to have happen. Okay, so this one is sort of uncommon. And this one is, is a common thing to have happen. So you go from the CPA firm to the client. Okay, now, this one gets a little bit kind of wacky because of there's rules if you are a non-issuer and additional rules if you are an issuer. Okay, so let's take uh, this one. Um, the auditor, I should say auditor, let's say employee. must be removed from the audit if they have accepted an offer employment offer or are considering, are still considering an offer. Okay, let me clean this up. Oops, that's not off, it should be offer. So if they've accepted an offer, or if they are still considering an offer, they haven't accepted it, but they haven't turned it down either. They must be removed from the audit. And this also applies to issuers too. So any, anytime that you have someone who is has either accepted a position or they're still considering it, they must be removed from the audit. Now they can do other things for other clients and so on, but they can't do anything for the audit for the um, for the potential the, either the, their their new employer or their potentially new employer. Now, if if they've already re rejected it, um, there's not a problem. You know, if someone says you want to work for IBM, they say no, I don't want to work for IBM. That's not a problem. They can still be on the audit then because there is no you know, conflict of interest there. But 
if they've accepted the offer or they're still considering, they must be removed from the audit. They can still do other things, they just can't do the audit. Okay. Any question on that? So you gotta be removed from the audit. And that goes for everybody, whether it's issuer or, or non issuer or issuer. Now, if it is an issuer, there is an additional hoop to jump through. If the offer is for a key financial position, Employee must be off oops, the audit for an entire audit cycle. And I will explain what that means in a second. So if the offer is for a key financial position, the employee must be off of the audit for the entire audit cycle. Okay. And, uh, so this is what an, uh, an entire audit cycle, what this means. This is actually, uh, can be a little bit severe here. Okay, um, you need a couple years on here. So, let's say that this is 20, 23. 2024 and this is 2025. Okay, and let's say they have a January 1st, you know, to uh, a calendar year for their audit. Okay, if the offer is given on uh, May 1st, 2023. Oops, key financial position, they have to be off for an entire audit cycle. Now, obviously for 2023, they're still on, you know, they were on the audit uh, for that first, whatever, uh, four months or whatever. So this is not a complete audit cycle. The first complete audit cycle will be in 2024. They could accept this offer on January first, 2025. That'd be the first time that they could work at this key finance position. So from May 2023, they have to sit out through all 2023, all of 2024. So it could be well over a year, depending on when they were given the offer um, to when they actually accept it. So this is a very kind of severe penalty. But I'll, I'll tell you why it came about, though. It, 
It, well, it came about because of this. It came about uh, because of this idea that they'll be working for the client after they take the job, right? So they're going to be in a key financial position at that point. You know, if, if, they, if there's a key financial position that they're leaving, you know, let's say they're going to go work as a chief financial officer for IBM. Okay, so that's going to be... So here's the problem that, um, so here's the problem that you have with that. You know, the people who are getting trained as auditors are usually getting trained by uh, seniors, um, managers, and partners. And oftentimes, managers, if they can't become partners, they'll be they'll take jobs. They were at least in the past. They would take jobs that are very high up in the client. You know, it wasn't I, uh, unusual to have a a controller who's the head accountant at a firm be come from their CPA firm, a uh, chief financial officer. Okay, so here's the problem. Immediately when they go over to the client, you are going to have the same people that those partners or seniors and possibly even partners trained are going to be sitting across the table from them doing the audit. So the, exactly the people that they've trained will be the ones doing the audit and they'll still be this. And by the way, probably somebody that they'll be looking to get a reference from in the future. You know, if, if you work for someone who, you know, you're, um, you know, the, the audit manager or something like that, you want to have them as a reference in the future. They're going to be sitting across from you during the audit. So to kind of avoid that conflict of interest, that's why these rules came up. They said, okay, look, they have to be completely clear of the audit for an entire cycle, which could possibly be even up to two years. Um, and it's to kind of give a, a breathing room in there for, um, you know, those relationships or whatever you want to call it to settle down or whatever. Now, someone could be taken off the audit ahead of time, you know, and not work on the audit for a couple of years or whatever. That's is technically okay so it really is just the um um those, those immediate people that they're not seeing across from someone that they need to get a reference from in the future while they do the audit um so it actually is, is a good is a, a, a good thing now here's the interesting thing about the rule it does not apply to the individual or the cpa firm it applies to the company the company may not hire anybody for a key position that hasn't been off the audit for an entire audit cycle. So they, they kind of put the onus on the company. Look, you can't hire this person. It's not, a, you know, if, and if the company does give a job to this person or whatever, it's, a, it's not a problem with whoever took the job. It's a problem with the company. You know, the company is going to have to answer to the SEC and probably remove that person from the, the position. So, Again, the onus for this is on the, you know, the employer who is regulated by the SEC, not on the individual or on the CPA firm. But regardless, the idea is that it, um, it keeps someone from getting in those key financial positions. Now, if it's not a key financial position, they can take it. It, it used to, and by the way, a few years ago, it was key position, any key position. So if you were a director or something like that of anything, um, but now they've kind of changed that to say, look, it has to be a key financial position, somebody who's going to be um, working with the financial statements or can influence the financial statements. So it is key financial position is a no-no. If it's some other position, that's not a problem. Okay. All right, so let's see how this works. So now... By the way, these still these rules still apply even if it is not a key financial position. They must be removed from the audit uh, if they are considering or if accept, accepted the offer. Okay, so let's take the first one. Sam is a member of the IBM audit engagement team. He's offered a job at IBM. Does that say it's a 
key financial position, so we will not insert that because it, may, it, it doesn't tell us that it is. Uh, Sam has not accepted or rejected the offer from IBM. Can, can Sam still work on the audit? What do you think? No. Uh, they cannot work on it if they are still considering it. And apparently Sam is still considering it. So Sam hasn't said one way or another, it has to be taken off the audit until it makes a decision. And if the decision is to accept it, then you can't be on the audit at all. Okay, so this is a no. Uh, George. He's a member of the IBM uh, engagement team. He recently got a job offer from IBM. The job is for a staff accountant. Okay. Can George immediately accept the IBM offer? So IBM, audit engagement. IBM is a publicly traded company, so this is going to be an issuer. Uh, he recently got a, a job offer from IBM, and the job is for a staff account. Can George immediately accept the IBM job offer? No. Actually, yes. Really? Oh. Yeah, well, and here's why. The, the staff accountant uh, is probably not a key financial position. Now, you know, it isn't accounting, which you'd expect, but uh, it's not a key financial position. Uh, staff accountant probably has very little input over, especially at IBM, um, the actual financial statements, preparation and all that. So this would probably be a yes. As long as it's not a key financial position, and what that means is usually like a chief financial officer or a control or something along those lines. Oh, here, like this next one. Uh, Lisa's member of the IBM audit engagement team. Okay, IBM is an issuer. They issue financial statements to the public. <laughs> Just learning how to use a computer here, that's all. Okay, um, so I remember she got a Job is the controller position. Now the controller is the top accountant in a, in a company. This is the top accounting position. So can Lisa immediately accept the, accept the offer, the IBM offer? No. No, she hasn't been, uh, for a key financial position, which the controller position would be, um, she has to be off the audit for an entire audit cycle. Oh, I got an issuer here. Why am I bringing that in there for twice? Okay, down here. Now, this is for a non-issuer. Mickey is a member of the GeoCorp audit engagement team. GeoCorp is a privately held company. She recently got a job offer from GeoCorp as their chief financial officer. Can Mickey immediately accept the offer? Now, remember that you know it, it's not an issuer. Are, these are the rules up here. You know that because I just made them green. So it's a non-issuer. Can Mickey? Accept the office, uh, the job offer. So again, 
So she is not going to be held to the um, the issuer rules. She, she, the, the GeoCorp is not controlled by the SEC. Can she take the offer? Oh, come on, flip a coin, be wrong once. What do you think? I think everybody has a gut feeling that no, she can't. But according to the rules, can she? You can put it in chat if you want, and I won't say your name. You can put it in private chat, and I won't say your name if you want to make a stab at it. Guys, we're going to be here all night. It's going to take forever. This class isn't exciting as it is, and we're going to be here forever. Oh, wait, someone's in chat. Uh, yes, and you're correct. Uh, yeah, she can take it. And she can take it because she, she does, these rules don't apply. You know, that key financial position, this is definitely a key financial position, but it doesn't matter because they don't have to follow. It's not an issue. It's a non-issue. So, yes, she can actually take the position. Now, here's the thing, though, about you might say, well, that's terrible. Why is that allowed? You know, it's not allowed for issuers, but it's allowed for non-issuers. Why? Well, you gotta remember too, generally non-issuers are gonna be smaller companies. And they're probably gonna smaller CPA firms working for them. You know, these are smaller places. And it would be unusual for someone to go from a CPA firm, even a smaller, you know, a regional or whatever CPA firm, and go to um work for a client that it wasn't kind of an elevated position. You know, there'd be no reason to, you know, there may only be three or four people in the accounting area or something at this place. So when someone goes from an audit, being an auditor, which is kind of a prestigious position, when they move to these, a lot of times it is an elevated position. And a lot of times, again, it's because it's, it's a smaller uh, work environment. You're not, you don't have you know, 60 people working for you, maybe you have six, or, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's generally a reduced, um, um, uh, it, 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 well, it's the same position as, 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 a, as a smaller group. So this is very common that it would be a higher position when you go into a smaller group, even if you were just a regular auditor moving into it because you have this experience. Okay. Um, all right, let's go to uh, family members. Now, similar to financial interest, the um, family uh, employment interest can also be and the thing with uh, family members close relatives can also cause uh, family members close relatives cannot occupy, and this is going to come up again. If I may be a better way to put it, be with a client. I should say with the client. So key financial positions are no, no. If it's not a key financial position, it's okay. And this is for both um, issuers and non-issuers.
Okay. So family member and close relatives that work for can also have kind of a family, it cannot occupy key finance positions. Okay, so uh, Sam is a member of the Up One Corp. That's company name. Engagement team. Sam's mother is the chief financial officer. Is Sam in violation of the independence rules? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you, you can't do an audit of your uh, of, of anywhere that your your mother is a, or you know close friends and relatives are a um, chief uh, uh, key financial position. Okay, Mary is a member of the Up Two Corp. A team. Mary's father is the director of design. Is Mary in violation of the rules? No. No, it's a key position, but it's not a key financial position. So this is no. Um, it, it has to be someone who influences the financial statements and the director of design will they have influence on the company is not going to be on the um, financial statements. Okay. Now, we get into a little bit more of um, the entire people in the rest of the company, in the rest of the CPA firm. Okay, so non covered members. All right, I'm going to zoom up to the top here for a second. You may be curious, say, okay, well, I know that, you know, these are the covered members, but don't these people have to follow any rules? Don't, you know, don't, don't the, uh, these non, um, you know, they don't, they can do whatever they want. And the answer is no. That while they have much more relaxed rules, these other people, these non um, covered member people, what they might call professional staff, they are they still have to have they still have to follow some rules, although they're much more relaxed. Okay. So, interest of non covered members. So, these are for people who are in the rest of the CPA firm who are not covered members. What rules do they have to follow? Okay, financial interests. They may own, oops, direct financial interests. as long as the no, ownership is less than 5%. So it's kind of the 5% rule. Are they came up with that? I don't know, but that's the rule. Okay, so they may own direct financial interest. So they can own a direct financial interest as long as the ownership is less than 5%. Now, for publicly traded companies, this probably isn't an issue. If somebody owned five percent of IBM, they'd probably, you know, own an island or two. But um, it could happen, especially in, in smaller, uh, you know, a, a smaller uh, CPA firms, especially if, if they're doing audits of local places. You know, it, it wouldn't be that uncommon. Oops, that's not. It wouldn't be that uncommon to have somebody who maybe their family owns a you know a regional chain of grocery stores. Let's say let's say they own ten grocery stores. Okay, and the kid goes to college and he gets a degree in accounting, comes back and works with a CPA firm, and that CPA firm does the audit of the family business. Now it's possible that that you know that person owns 
10% of the business you know, because they're a family member or whatever. And if that's the case, obviously that's a conflict of interest. They cannot work on that audit. So, well, uh, for publicly traded companies, if you own 5% of a publicly traded company, you're probably you know, <laughs> pretty wealthy. Um, for non publicly traded companies, it's, um, it, it, could, it could definitely be a, uh, more of an issue just because family businesses and things like that. Okay. Um, employment interests. Uh, they cannot be key financial position, obviously. Okay, they cannot have a key financial position. Or be a director of the client. Now, the key financial position is probably a pretty obvious one, but this director position is a little bit different. Sometimes people are on board of directors for different reasons. And, but they cannot be on the board of directors um, and, and have them do the audit. I actually had a student who worked for a, um, a not-for-profit and on the board of directors, they, one of the board of directors had a CPA firm, who knows why, that board of directors, you know, the person on the board of directors said, look, we'll do the audit, you know, and we'll do it pro bono or whatever. They did this audit and of course it's not valid. They, they had to get a second audit done because um, of this conflict of interest. So uh, you, you cannot do an audit if you're on a board of directors. There's, there's a loophole in that, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay, um, so, James is a senior auditor for a CPA firm that audits IBM. However, James is not a covered member. Okay, so not a covered member. So James has nothing to do with the audit. James is also an ordained minister and recently accepted a position on IBM's board of directors as a spiritual director. Okay, again, they can have different people on boards of directors. It's very common. Uh, James is not on the audit committee at IBM. So does nothing to do with the audit committee is on the board of directors of the spiritual director. Will James position impact the CPA firm's independence? What do you think? You can put it in chat. Put it in chat to me and I'll, I won't say your name. Unless you want me to. Uh, it actually will. This is a no, no. Will it, will it impact the firm's yes. And they're very strict about this rule. Uh, for the audit engagement period, it can't, they can't, they couldn't have been on the audit on the, um, as a director for even one day. This is an all or nothing thing. Were they ever on the board of directors? If it's yes, the CPA firm is not, is no longer independent. So if they have somebody who is on the board of directors for even one day, no matter what the position is, uh, it will render them, um, the whole CPA firm is not independent.
Now, I think I, I, I mentioned there is kind of a um, loophole. And the loophole generally comes from not, not anything um, serious, but it, sometimes the, these board of directors are, these positions are given to people as an honorary thing. They don't vote on anything. They have no voting rights on the board of directors, but they bring them on the board of directors. Oftentimes things like non-for-profits and things like that, well, you know, if you're auditing a, um, a community college, they may want you on the board of directors just so they can point out, oh, by the way, look at all these professional people we have and we have this, you know, this is our auditor on there and you show up a couple times a year, you, you know, eat cookies and talk to people and uh, you don't vote on anything, you, you don't have any vote, you know, what it, if, it's, if it's purely an honorary position, it's okay. If you have no um, influence over voting on anything for the board, uh, doing any work for the board other than you know the audit and that sort of thing, then it's okay. But it has to be purely honorary. If you have any um, duties, you know, uh, beyond this honorary thing where they put you on a plaque or something, um, then it's uh, then it's, it's a no no. And even if it's one day, uh, you can't do it. Okay. Uh, what time is it? Uh, we'll keep going. Uh, how much is the left? It seems like there's a lot left here. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of things here, and then we'll. All right. Well, we're not going to finish this. Thing. Okay. Uh, past professional fees. Unpaid audit fees can um, The client. Okay. Unpaid audit fees. So let's say the client hasn't paid you. And whatever the reason doesn't, you know, we're not going to, it doesn't matter at this point. Unpaid audit fees, uh, you know, if they if you've done the audit and in the past or whatever, and they haven't paid the fees, that can be interpreted as either an investment or a loan to the client, which means you are no longer independent. So it is very possible that if there's unpaid audit fees, you say to the client, look, if you don't pay these fees, we can't do the audit because this makes us basically an investor. Either to get our money back, we have to, you know, we have an, uh, an, an interest in seeing you do well, uh, or it can be seen as us lending you money or investing in your, you know, in your firm. So. Unpaid audit fees are a, can be a problem in that they must be paid before uh, the auditor can be independent. So un unpaid audit fees are um, are an independence issue. And we'll do gifts and then we'll stop here. Gifts. Um, gifts are a, uh, this is one this is one of the few situations where they are more. Um, it's more of a problem in the United States than in other countries. Okay, gifts. Oops. Should be clearly immaterial. Oops. Or Appropriate in the circumstance. And I'll tell you what this really means. <laughs> so it should be clearly immaterial, so immaterial, or appropriate in the circumstance. Now, this appropriate in the circumstance is what I call the golf outing rule. 
because uh, some of these golf outings are done on private courses that have crazy uh, fees that a round of golf might cost several thousands of dollars, the, you know, material amounts. But in the circumstance, they are considered to be okay because the circumstance is playing golf, you know, in a private setting or whatever that the client is used to, I guess, uh, that that would be, uh, that it's appropriate in the circumstance. Now, again, this is mostly the United States. Some Asian countries are a little bit like this, but very few other countries are like this. They usually, America is golf crazy. And so when they have these, um, and these fees are just like nutty. Um, so amounts that would be absolutely deemed as material, uh, say in Europe, uh, are okay in the United States because they're appropriate in the, in the circumstance. And again, I really call that the golf rule because it's, it usually has to, has to do with these golf outings. Um, but anyway, appropriate in the circumstance. So either, either immaterial or appropriate in the circumstance. And I know that that sounds like a, a kind of a loophole thing, but it, it kind of is. But uh, yeah. All right. Uh, let's stop there. We'll stop that litigation. And I'm going to leave a little extra time for the um, the monitoring unit sampling because I usually run out of time on that one. Okay, so we we should be able to finish this up next time. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here, but yeah, we'll, we'll finish up next time. Okay, so let's say um, let's be back at what uh, sub no two. Let me pull up the next one. We're going to do that is something completely different. This is the one I'm looking for. Okay, so let's pull up the monetary unit sampling and we'll get started on this one. Oops. Okay, so let's say be back at um, Okay, and we will start up on my treatment sampling. Uh, we're on page four, I think. Okay, any questions? All right, let me save this one and then I'll. Okay.
Okay, um, so uh, monitoring unit sampling. The next thing we're going to talk about. Well, for, first, I tell you, let's review a little bit of what it was. So you recall from last time, monitoring unit is when we take a chunk of Sorry about that. I thought I was going to sneeze. Uh, it's when you take a chunk of, you know, the <clears throat> you, you take the, to the total amount, you break it up into these chunks that we call intervals, and you let one item represent the entire interval. And there are some advantages to doing that. So this is what we're talking about for the monetary unit sampling. Again, this like what we talked about last time is that we're breaking it up, and you put it into these. It's, it's sort of it's almost like you've broken it up into smaller sampling groups and just taken one item from each of these smaller sampling um, groups. <clears throat> okay. And we figured out kind of the basics of it, how we get a sample size. And now we come to the wacky part of it. Okay, some rules. Um, incremental allowance. If there are any errors, it increases the amount that the books may be off. All right, so. So, if, if, for instance, if you do an audit and there are no errors, um, you are more sure of it, right? You're more sure of it saying, okay, we didn't find any errors, and we probably, you know, if there was a problem, we probably should have found at least something. Um, but we didn't find any errors, so, you know, that is uh, an indication that the books are, or we can rely on, on the numbers more. Now, if you do find errors, that leaves the possibility that there might be more. Okay, so if you do find an error in a sample, it says, okay, you know, we may not be looking at a bell curve that looks like this, maybe it looks like this, because we found errors, we know that they're possible. So, you know, now it's uh, things are a little bit riskier. So incremental allowance is when they are, there's a potential that any of the intervals could be off by a greater amount. Okay. So let's go back here. Okay, so you're gonna lost. <clears throat> so the more misstatements are detected, that it increases the amount that the books might be off by. And it matters how big the misstatements are. A big misstatement will say the books could be off by more. It's a small misstatement than less. It's only used when the book value of the misstated item is less than the interval. And we'll talk about that too. This is kind of a wacky one. Monetary unit sampling is used to detect overstatements. Understatements are ignored. So not only aren't we looking for understatements, if we do find one, we ignore it. So if the audit value is, I should say greater than, so if the audit value is greater than the book value, so it's understated, you know, we find that this is worth more than the book says, We ignore it. Which as an auditor, that really bugs me. <laughs> so it's a personal issue, not a uh, theoretical one. If the misstated item has a, 
a book value that is equal to or larger than the interval. Then we actually we go to the actual misstatement, which is like this down here. Book value minus the audit value for the item. And we'll talk about that and why. Okay. Let's see how a lot of these are. These are those things that you have to kind of go through. <clears throat> okay, the first three here. Excuse me. The first three here are are kind of normal, shall we say? They're they're the usual ones. So we'll kind of get back in the habit of doing this. So we have something that has an audit value of fourteen thousand. We look at the book value, and the book value is um, twenty thousand. So we take our ratio, and for Mr. Calculator, oh, I don't have my phone. All right. Okay, so the projected value of this is 28,000. And the projected misstatement is the rest of it. So 40 minus 28, 12. And don't worry about this yet. We'll, we'll talk about the incremental allowance in a second. <clears throat> uh, this one is also kind of run of the mill. We'll do that one. Sorry, I'm sneezing. All right. Um, and so the projected misstatement there would be 40,000 minus 32 is 8,000. Uh, audit value for this one is zero. So they got in their books for 1700 is actually zero. This would be zero. And what would the misstatement be? Forty thousand. Forty thousand. Uh, the book might tell you, uh, some books anyways, might tell you that you, you should look into seeing why this is zero and not, you know, Whatever. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is, you, you, do, you should do that for any of them. Anytime you come up with a discrepancy, you should see why there's a discrepancy and all that. Uh, for whatever reason, they single out these ones that are zero. But um, anyway, if, if it does happen to be that this is zero and this is 1700, that the projected misstatement is 40,000. Okay, so that, and that's kind of what we've done before. Okay, now number four is different than the other ones. Why? What's different about number four compared to one through three? The audit value is greater than the book value. Exactly. This is an understatement. And this method is not designed to find understatements. Here now. Oh, um, 
Up and on our knees. Okay, so this is an understatement, <clears throat> and it's less than the audit value. We're not supposed to find these. Notice that if they only put that down as 1900, there's less of a chance of getting picked than if they had put it correctly at 2600. It's not supposed to find these things. And when we do, we ignore it. Projected misstatement for this one would be zero. And again, as an auditor, when you find something that's wrong, you say, hey, this is wrong. But in this method, you just gotta let it go because this method says we're not supposed to find those. And when we do, they just, we just ignore it. Okay, so if there is an understatement, understatements are not supposed to be caught. You know, this is when the audit value is greater than the book value. This is supposed to happen, so the projected misstatement will be zero. Okay, now here are the confusing ones. Uh, yeah, and this is why this is these are confusing. It's confusing because of this. Notice. that they, yeah, I mean, I'm going to take the highlighting off that for a second. I'm going to take that out completely. I'm going to move this over. Yeah, I know, I'll do it this way. Because th this has nothing to do with the one below. That's what I'm trying to <laughs> awkwardly say. Now, notice that the 44,000, the book value, is greater than the interval. Larger than. Oops. Oh, thank. Uh, larger than, yeah. okay. So, by the way, there's a 100% chance of this one being caught. This is exactly what this method is supposed to catch. When someone overstates something to a point where it's, at some point it becomes 100% sure that you are going to catch it. And this is what this has done. This should be 11,000. They've overstated it to 44,000. It's 100% sure that this is going to get caught now when it comes to what the loss is um there's a problem and the problem comes from partly from me not having the right camera the problem comes from the idea of sampling sampling is the idea that you take something small and project it over the larger population right Take us, you know, you take 10 items projected over the population of 120 items or whatever it is. You're projecting it over. This one is the this one is the opposite. The item that we pick for our you know to do for our sample is actually larger than the sample itself. The sample, the interval for this one item is 40,000, whereas our item is 44,000. When this happens, we switch over and do just the actual amount of the misstatement we don't project it over anything because if you think about it the sample the, the sample is larger than population as a whole it's one of those weird kind of things we have forty-four thousand in the item and only forty thousand in the sample for that item so at that point we switch over and we just do the total soft by and if you actually work it out if you did our ratio thing that we did in the past, it would reduce the amount of the misstatement. So what we would do for this one is say this is um, so forty-four thousand. Let me add it up here. Ah. 
try that again. Okay, so 44,000 minus the 11,000 equals what, 33,000? 30, oh, let's find a different sum. How about this one? So this is the 33,000. This will be the misstatement. So when it is larger than the interval itself, and this comes about because our, our sample of 44,000 is actually larger than the interval. Then we go, we switch over and do the actual misstatement for the item. If you did the ratio, it would actually come out to be a little bit less. It'll be 10,000 or 30,000. Okay, so let me find something here. On that one. Okay, let's do the same thing for this down here. It's the same situation. We have a larger sample than the interval. This would cost at least two intervals, maybe even three. But the idea is exactly the same. You're going to find the actual uh, mistake. So the item is 90,000, it should be 65. Uh, but now this 90,000 is going to be um, the overstatement, you know, or excuse me, includes the overstatement. And so we're gonna do the actual amounts. Oh, oh, wrong, wrong, wrong. Yeah, hold on. 90,000. That was the bad teacher. All right, whatever that is. What's 90,000 minus 60? 25? I use 25,000. So this would be our mistake. This is the actual misstatement. Any questions so far? Okay, so 
our total misstatements here would be if we add all these up, this would be the total for these. Hyper calculator. Hundred and eighteen thousand. So we would say that the misstatements here are one hundred and eighteen thousand. Our total book value was eight hundred thousand. And so the projected value is whatever, 800,000 minus that. You say projected mistake. Uh, 682,000. Okay, now. Here's the tricky part, <laughs> as if this wasn't tricky so far. Incremental allowance. Incremental allowance is used when there could be more bad things in the interval. So for instance, our book value here, our item that we took for this interval was 20,000. So there's still another, what, 20,000 left in that interval that could go wrong. So if there's more things that could go wrong in that interval, we have to do what they call an incremental allowance, which we'll probably get to next week. We'll get to it. Well, we'll see. So is it included? Yes. Okay, we go to the second one. The book value is 3,000. So there's still, what, 37,000 left in that interval that could go wrong. So this would also be included in the incremental. There could be more things wrong with it. Uh, Save with number three. We found, uh, you know, this item was for $1,700. There's another, whatever, 38300 left in there. So this could also go wrong. <clears throat> this one, it really doesn't matter, but it's not, a, it's not a problem at all. There is no misstatement. So this one will be somewhat unusual no but it's actually it, it wouldn't even be a misstatement at all there's no misstatement there as it turns out it wouldn't matter whether they put it in or not but we'll see why later okay now here's the wacky two you'll notice that this covers the entire interval the items we selected completely covered our interval Nothing else could go wrong with that interval. So if you're in this situation down here where the, the book value for an item is greater than the interval, it is not, there's nothing incremental. It could not get any worse. There's nothing left in that interval. The entire population of that interval has been taken up. It, nothing else could go wrong. And same thing down for this one. Nothing else could go wrong. Why? Because our the items. Did I just change that? We did. Um, the items that we pick in our, you know, for to test is actually more than the total population theoretically. Um, so there could not be anything more wrong. Now, it's, it's, 
We say the mistake is 25,000. That's all it can be. It's covered the entire interval. There's nothing left in that population of 40,000, the 40,000 dollar interval population. There's nothing left in it that could go more wrong. So the first three will be included in the incremental allowance, which we haven't <laughs> we haven't done the calculations for yet. And the last three um, will not be included. This one is not a misstatement at all. This one you can take out completely. If you're actually looking at this for a audit work papers, you probably wouldn't include that one. But um, it wouldn't matter anyways. So these three will be will cause incremental allowances. These two will not. And these are the rules for it up here. So this is um, the incremental allowances for things that have the book value of the misstated item is less than the interval. And this is where the misstated book value of the item is equal to or larger than. In other words, nothing else could go wrong in them. And they will not be included in the incremental allowance. And we simply take the actual misstatement. Okay, we'll get started on this one. We'll see how far we get. We might be able to finish it. I don't, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, here's some things we're going to need in the future. We'll ignore those for now. And let's jump into uh, these are the things that we found, the misstatements we found in. Or constitute the sample, and I'll go. I'll be quiet. And let you guys work on these for a little bit. So here's the uh, audit value. Here's the book values, and here's the interval. And work through these. I'll give you a hint. The first two are okay. The third one is unusual. So see if you can do the first two, and then we'll talk about the third one. Okay, what's unusual about the third one? The audit value is higher? Yeah, it, the audit value is higher. This is a, um, this is an understatement. Uh, a word, but we'll see it that way for now. This is an understatement, and when we find an understatement, we ignore it. So this is actually no misstatement at all, even though there's <laughs> an auditor, you go, hey, wait, I found something wrong here. Um, it is not in this statement under this using this method.
Okay, now the incremental allowance. This is the tricky part. Well, first of all, let's go to this one. This not this would be a no. It's not misstated at all. So that's the easy one. If there's no misstatement, it doesn't really matter. Uh, now the book value is ten thousand, and the interval is fifty thousand. So our sample basically was 10,000. The interval, the entire population for that item was 50,000. So could more things go wrong with that inside that interval? Without an error, could there be more things that are an error? You can put it in chat if you want. Yes. Yep. This will be an incremental allowance. And same thing over here. You know, this item was for 4,000. The interval was 50,000. So there's still, what, 46,000 worth of that interval that could be wrong. So it'll be an incremental allowance there too. So both of these would be have incremental allowances. Okay, we're going to add up the projected misstatements. This will be our projected misstatement here. Forty thousand. And this is our best estimate as far as what the books are misstated by. So if, if someone say, well, what, what's your best guess as far as what they're off by or not guess? What's your best estimate as far as what they're at, they're off by is forty thousand. Um, Capsule. So this is uh, so six million dollars is the book value of the council. So let me kind of show you what's going on with this. Hey, wait a minute. My background's all blurry. Why did I? You know what? I think I got video settings on or something, don't I? I'll worry about this later. <laughs> I I think that that might be. I don't know. Is my camera or what? Anyway, Mark, focus. Focus. Okay. So uh, it's sort of like this. If we were kind of to chart this thing out, <clears throat> now this is not going to be to scale, just so you know. But it, it sort of looked like this. So if this was zero dollars, and this is what they say that the books were worth. That this, that this would be 800,000. No, 800,000, what is it? Six million. Let's try that again. Okay, so these are books, so these are $6 million. What we're saying is our best estimate of the misstatement, our projected misstatement, and again, this isn't to scale or anything, but our projected misstatement is that this is off by 40,000.
there now it's completely unreadable okay so we're saying that this is off by our best estimate is this is off by 40,000 now because this is a sample it could be off by more and there's two things that come into play um basic precision you don't have to write this down i'll put it i'll put it on the screen in a second here and then also incremental allowance so it's sort of like this you know this is under a bell curve and it could kind of go like that you know that there could be greater things that are off because this is only for overstatements it won't go this is a, what they call a one tail test but it could be off by more we'll talk about basic precision and then incremental allowance um, but these could actually be off by more than that so forty thousand is our best estimate this is our best estimate what they're off it's off by but it could be off by more. And it has two things that has to do with that is basic precision and incremental allowance, which we'll talk about right now. <clears throat> okay. Okay, basic precision. Uh, I'm going to go all the way to the end here. Actually, I should put this up. Our basic precision is all the way at the end. The last thing on the whole hand, though, is our basic precision. Copy it, move it up. Oops. Wow, you're a big. <laughs> Got a little crazy with that one, didn't I? All right. So, basic precision. Oh, I get it, I get it. Yeah. Basic precision equals our interval times a reliability factor. Okay, so how much is our interval? 50,000. Our interval is 50,000. And we are going to multiply that by our reliability factor. I thought I had these closer. Oh, I, I do. Wait. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. So our reliability factors. So this is our reliability factors here. I should I should have that labeled somewhere. Somewhere. Okay. So we gotta come up here. And the risk of incorrect acceptance is 5%. Okay, so uh, we use the zero overstatements, and I'll tell you why in a second. 5%. And so our reliability factor is 3. Uh, 50,000, well, 50,000 times three is about 150. Oops. Oops. 
Okay, so this is our basic precision. Now this is if there are no errors. It could still be off because it's a sample. Okay, so going back to this thing, here's what we're saying. Okay, we came up that it's off by 40,000. Basic precision says even if there weren't any errors, it could still be off. This is a sample, right? So unless you take 100%, it could be off. The basic precision is if there are no errors, how much could it, additional could it be off by? And in this case, it's 150,000. So what we're saying is that Even though 40,000 is what we think this is, our best estimate as far as what this is off by. It could be off by another 150,000 just because it's a sample. And samples, you know, are they, there's uh, some air in there and, you know, there could be, it could be off by more than that. And at 5%, it could be off by up to 150,000. Okay. Now, the last thing is the incremental allowance. Now, this is only if there are errors. If there's no errors, you don't do an incremental allowance. Okay, now, get ready for the wackiest thing in the whole shebang. All right. Incremental allowance. The first thing we're going to calculate are these incremental uh, factors. And... These are wacky. The incremental factors come from the table down here. And what they say is, okay, if there is an overstatement, we're going to have to multiply the incremental amount of it by this incremental factor to get what we think it could off be off by and additionally off by because we found an error. Okay, so coming down to the table here, at one overstatement, the reliability factor is 4.75. Incrementally over the zero factor, it's three. And again, this is just a, this is a formula. Minus one, and this will be our incremental factor. So four point, and turn the calculator on first. It's a, yeah. Okay, 4.75 minus three minus one. I could have done this in my head. Uh, 0.75. Let's do the incremental factor for the second one. Incremental factor for the second one is 6.3. Overstatement, 2. Minus overstatement one, the incremental amount. Hey, did I? Um, 4.75 minus one, whatever that is. So 6.3 minus 4.75 minus one equals 0.55. Okay, uh, last one. Uh, at three misstatements, it's 7.76.
minus six point three zero minus one. Is it? 4.467 is 1.6. So these are the incremental factors. Now, <laughs> what you're probably saying is, well, couldn't there just be a table for that? I mean, we're, we're using the same, you know, if you're using 5%, these factors are going to be the same on uh, every audit using 5%. And if you were doing the same thing over here for 10%, it'd be easy to all be the same. Yes, you could easily make an incremental factor table for whatever reason um, they don't. Okay. Now, let's see how this works. We go to our misstatements. This one actually isn't a misstatement, so we can ignore it. But... Um, so these are the misstatements, and we always take the largest misstatement first. So our largest misstatement first is 30,000. So our incremental allowance is 0.75 times 30,000. We take our next largest, which is 10,000, that goes in the second one. So you start out with the largest first. Fifty-five hundred. Fifty-five hundred. And notice this last one; it wouldn't matter anyways. But the misstatement is zero. It really doesn't. It's not a misstatement at all. But even if you were to put it in there, you know, it wouldn't matter. So adding all these up, the incremental allowance would come out to. Oops. Okay, it's not letting me come over here. Oh, wait, here we go. Twenty-two, twenty-eight thousand. So 22,500 plus 5,500 to 28,000. So this would be the additional amount that this could be off by. And if you're saying, well, it's kind of wacky, it is. Again, the incremental allowance is because that we have, if we find errors, it could be up by even more. Notice that we didn't find any errors, you know, these would be all zeros and you wouldn't even have to do it. But if you do have errors, then you have to go to the incremental allowance if they, if they apply to it. It's incremental allowance and then they uh, will get added to it. So in this case, it would be 28,000 more. So going back to this thing, uh, this could be off by another 28,000. Buzz around here. 28,000. Okay. So, so our best estimate is off by 40, but basic precision says if there's no errors, it could be off by another 150,000. However, we found error, so there's an incremental allowance of 28,000. So we're going to add all three of these up, and this will give us what we would call our upper limit on misstatements.
In other words, at 5%, You know, how sure are we of this thing? Okay, so let's back to I'm going to go down here and put these all in a nice deleting it. And these three together will give us our upper limit on this standards. Okay. No. No. Okay, so what is that? One fifty. The two eighteen. Calculate around forty plus one fifty. Yeah, two eighteen. And so this is what we're going to say our upper limit. So, and this is the number we'll use to determine whether they are materially misstated. Uh, and again, this is a question mark I'll put there because this, while we should all get the 2,000, uh, 218,000, whether it's materially misstated is still a question. You know, it's $6 million if being off by 218 is material or not is a judgment call. So sort of like this, our upper limit on this statement says that this could be off by as much as 218,000. And this is the number we would use to determine whether they are materially misstated. Our best estimate is that it's only off by 40,000. However, this is a sample. So at 5%, we're 5% sure that it won't be off by more than 218,000. And we don't have to worry about the upside because um, understatements are ignored. So this is this is the amount that we would have. 40,000 is our best estimate, but then there's kind of this one tail curve and it could be off by 50,000 just because it's a sample and another 28,000 because we found some errors. If we don't find any errors, it's just that. If you test and nothing happens, and it's just 40,000 plus 190,000. But because we did find errors, we're going to bump up a little bit more on the incremental. All right. Question on that? <laughs> it's a lot. I know. We're going to do. Uh, at least one more of these, and I think we got even one more after that that we're going to do in, uh, in our review. So, okay, that's probably enough fun for tonight. Let's stop here. Oops. Uh, nothing to turn in this week. Yeah, if you turned your uh, Test and haven't graded. I'll I'll grade those tonight if, if for anyone who's who turned theirs in uh, or the you know recently. Let me see. Oops, that's not me. You took us my haircut. There, that's me. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay. Well, I will see you guys next week. Nothing to turn in this week. Uh, next week. Next week, we'll probably finish up both of these. We'll probably finish with chapter three and then also um, the 
mantra unit sample. So probably next week we'll have a chapter three practice um, multiple choice questions and then uh, I'll send the exam out and we'll finish up both the chapter three handout and probably the, um, uh, you know, that might be a little ambitious. I mean, I, maybe the uh, monitoring unit sample. Okay, any questions? Okay, and look, two minutes early. Well, you guys aren't going to know what to do with your time. Okay, uh, two minutes early. I'll, uh, I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.